Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Thanks for that uh, intro, uh, David. Um, so in the next uh, few minutes, we're gonna give you uh, a whirlwind tour of genetic testing and advanced prostate cancer and, how, uh, and try to show how this has become very important in our management of advanced disease. Um, so, um, oh yeah, sorry, we have a little delay. Um, so basically, how's this all? Uh, how's this all happening? This is happening thanks to the government's completion of the Human Genome Project. Uh, it took them 13 years to map the entire genome. Now that's not exactly true, because those of you that follow some of these scientific discoveries realize that in April uh, of this year they completed the last seven or eight percent of the Genome Project. So this is a massive undertaking and has really revolutionized everything that we're doing in medicine. But we're going to focus on the advances uh, that we have had with uh, with prostate cancer um, in uh, in the last few years. So um, something happened in 2013 and the world really changed. Two major occurrences 10 years after the completion of the Genome Project was the Angelina Jolie presentation to the world that you can inherit cancer based on genetics of your parents. So she brought the world the concept that BRCA could increase um, the um, cancer risk uh, of an individual. But another very interesting thing happened that same year, and the Supreme Court of the United States decreed that DNA could not be patented. What happened until that time, there was only one company that really was able to offer uh, genetic or genomic testing uh, and sort of had the lock on BRCA. Well, after that, uh, Supreme Court reading, now many, many other companies were able to enter the world of uh, genetic and genomic testing. So I show you this to just give you some idea about the very rapid, uh, the very rapid uh, advances that are taking place in this area. Before 2016, the only place you can find information on BRCA and prostate cancer inherited disease was in the breast and ovarian cancer guidelines. In early 2016, the first mention of a family history and BRCA one or two for prostate cancer screening occurred. And by 2017 was the first mention of the importance of familial and hereditary genetic consideration. So this is a very, very new field to us in, uh, in urology and prostate cancer. Uh, 2018, the guidelines talked about germline testing based on risk for treatment decisions. And by 2021, uh, it was not only just to be considered, but it was now recommended based on the individual patient's risk. So we were very involved with this uh, at uh, Thomas Jefferson University. We did the first two international consensus conferences addressing this. Many of our faculty who were on this uh, program participated. But this was to bring urologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, geneticists, patients together to say, okay, what, what should we be doing with this new world of genetic testing in prostate cancer and inherited risk? So we're going to talk about these topics in the next couple of minutes. The first thing I want to just uh, do for everyone is just give you a little basic conceptual framework for genomic and uh, genetic testing. So I know we have a very uh, knowledgeable audience here, uh, but a few terms are important to stress. Traditional genetics is individual genes. Today, genomics takes into account multiple different genes interacting with each other and in the environment. So today, when we use the term genetic testing, we are really looking at genomic testing. We're looking at a large number of different genes in an individual. And why an individual, while an individual gene may be important, in general, panels of genes today are how we study uh, the inheritance patterns of cancers such as prostate. So the use of genomic and genetic testing relies on computational biology. So here's just an example of the BRCA2 gene. Um, this, this gene is 27 exons. There are 10,000 base pairs. 
This is just one small portion of one of the exons. This gene is 12 pages long, and you might imagine how difficult it is without the use of computers to figure out, is there an alteration in the GTCGA sequence of, uh, of base pairs? So this is kind of my spin on modern tumor uh, evaluation. We do gross pathology, histology. We look at the cell, the nucleus. But today we're now getting down to going beyond the chromosomes, but doing genomic analysis of individual tumor cells. And this has become very important, particularly in our area of advanced prostate cancer management. Now, if in this 20-minute uh, lecture, there's only one slide that you remember, this may be the most important slide. There are germline mutations and somatic mutations. Germline mutations are the ones that inhabit every cell in your body, except for your red cells, uh, and that you inherit these from your parents. Somatic mutations are mutations that take place in the tumor that can sort of be called the wild west of the tumor. You cannot pass somatic mutations on to your offspring. Only germline mutations can be passed on to your offspring to increase the risk of cancer like Angelina Jolie. It is important to note though that you can detect the germline mutation when you do a somatic tumor mutation analysis. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, more about that in a couple of minutes. So here's just an overview of genetic or genomic testing in prostate cancer. Genomic profiling is really the proprietary molecular signatures from a variety of companies that help us make treatment and management decisions. Genomic tumor sequencing can be done from the tumor or from the liquid biopsy. And this looks at extensive panel of normal and mutated genes and helps to guide therapies. And this is becoming very important for advanced therapeutics, such as looking at things like the PARP inhibitors or looking at things like pembrolizumab that we'll talk about a little bit later. Lastly, there is in the inherited cancer risk testing where you can look for, to screen patients for inherited and, uh, abnormalities that may increase their risk of developing prostate cancer. Last thing is just a term to mention that gets thrown around a lot, next generation sequencing or deep sequencing. Basically, this is one of the big advantages of the, uh, of the Human Genome Project. We now have gene chip technologies that very rapidly, sometime in just a few hours, can sequence a large number of genes very quickly. And the reason you call it deep sequencing is because you go back to an area of interest of the genome over and over and over again to minimize read errors to make sure that you're not going to make a mistake. And this is just a little difference between the recreational uh, genomics that you can order online very often for very low cost and real medical genetic testing that you do through a laboratory that can be much more expensive because, again, it undergoes more and more validation. I want to just mention the area of polygenetic risk scores because this is coming on very quickly. Remember that polygenetic risk scores look at SNPs. SNPs are single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms that we all have that are variations on our genes that give us brown hair, blue eyes, red hair, and things like that. But we're now identifying these different SNPs in different patients. They're not inherited in general, but they can occur uh, in the transmission of different diseases or different characteristics to offspring. So, this is a hot area of research. You can see these papers have just been coming out over the last year or two. Again, these are not inherited mutations, but these are naturally occurring variations that may actually interact with mutated genes. Next, I wanna talk for a few minutes about prostate cancer and inherited risks. At the end of the day, 70, 80% of our prostate cancer patient uh, uh, cases are still sporadic. There is no known uh, family history, familial, there's sort of an idea there may be an inherited gene, but you can't identify a mutation. Hereditary is about 10 to 15% of cases where you can clearly identify a single inherited mutation in something such as BRCA1 or BRCA2 that greatly increases the patient's likelihood of developing prostate cancer. Remember these mutated genes 
again, when we talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2, in the terms of this discussion, we're talking about mutated genes. These genes do not cause cancer, but increase risk. We don't know exactly how they do it in general, but we know that they do interfere in many ways with DNA repair pathways that we will, we will talk about. And remember, these increase the risk in the individual and in the family members for other cancers, such as breast, ovarian, pancreatic, these increase the risk of male breast cancer as well. So we do this genomic and germline testing really to identify risk in families, but today we really do it a lot in advanced prostate cancer to identify actionable genes. Here's just a short list of the very, very commonly mutated genes in prostate cancer. You can see the genes listed here. But the mechanism, if you note, is almost always somewhere in the DNA damage repair pathway. And this is one of the reasons that these patients are set up to develop a variety of tumors. Their DNA repair pathways are abnormal. I note the HOXB13 gene here, which is a little bit different. That is the clearly defined inherited prostate cancer. Many men with high-risk disease under the age of 50 to 55, that is the inherited um, prostate cancer gene. Very rare, but it is out there. So what do we have with advanced prostate cancer? Very important paper came out in 2016 that showed that germline mutations are very common in metastatic prostate cancer. And in fact, you can see the common suspects here, BRCA2, BRCA1, check, and ATM, that germline mutations are very common in metastatic disease, much less common in localized disease. As years have gone on, we now realize that maybe up to 25% of men with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer may harbor these, uh, abnormal, uh, these abnormal genes. So what is a mutated BRC1 or 2, um, BRCA1 or 2 gene do with prostate cancer? Well, it's a DNA damage response gene. It interferes with our ability to repair um, alterations that occur uh, in our DNA. It increases the lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer. Again, in ladies, BRCA1 is much more important than BRCA2. In men, the BRCA2 mutation significantly increases the lifetime risk. It increases the risk of not only prostate cancer, but that you may develop gleasinate, you may have a higher likelihood of advanced disease. And also remember, it increases the risk in the individual for things like pancreatic and male breast cancer. But if it's inherited in other siblings or in the children, it increases the risk of these other hereditary cancers. Very important today as we talk about PARP inhibitors, identifying these metastatic cancers that may be associated with inherited germline mutation. Anyone who doesn't believe that these germline mutations are bad, this is a very classic paper from Hopkins. If you look at the orange curve, the time to death is, uh, is around 10 years if you have a mutated gene in metastatic cancer. If you don't have uh, a mutated gene and develop metastatic cancer, you live much, much longer. So again, we know these DNA repair pathway genes are bad. We're learning how to use them for screening and much more importantly for, for treatment. So here's an example of uh, the BRCA mutations in orange, prostate, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and male breast cancer. Again, you can see that BRCA mutations in breast cancer in ladies are much more dire than they are in men. However, when you find them in men, um, it certainly increases the risk of prostate, pancreatic, as well as male breast cancer. So again, if you look at localized prostate cancer, how many have mutations that, propose, uh, that predispose to uh, prostate cancer? It's actually very small. But if you follow these men out, it's the men with these germline mutations end up looking metabolically, molecularly, and in their lifetime, more like metastatic disease. So this is something that we're starting to learn about. How important is it for early prostate cancer to identify these genetic abnormalities? It's very clear for late prostate cancer, it's very important, but early prostate cancer continues to be a little controversial. What I wanna to move to next are the practical considerations for genetic testing. It's clear that urology needs to be more focused on a family history of breast, ovarian, and other cancers. Using our commercial sponsors forms is very helpful for us in this area. 
Um, we've been very involved with this since 2014 in our multidisciplinary clinic where we incorporated prostate cancer genetics testing as part of our treatment model when patients first present with prostate cancer, letting them know if they need genetic counseling. And again, I'll skip over this in the interest of time, but this is where genetic counselors become very important for us. As I mentioned earlier, there are prostate cancer specific panels that are being developed thanks to next generation sequencing. Again, many companies are out there offer prostate cancer specific panels. Your particular institution or your practice may choose just one of these companies. Uh, other companies don't have prostate cancer panels, but they have general risk screening for cancer. These are a little bit trickier to deal with because these may end up with uh, identifying problems in patients that maybe they or you didn't want to know about. Important to recognize when you do germline testing, if you do it, you may find pathogenic genes, you may find benign genes, or you may find something known as a VUS, which is a variant of unknown significance. These are genes that we don't know exactly if they're problematic or not. They go into a large database at the NIH and eventually need to be checked for validation that they are just a naturally occurring gene that's not pathogenic or that it is pathogenic. Again, this is where we rely on our genetic um, counselors very heavily. Moving now to somatic DNA tumor testing, tissue biopsy is the most common, liquid biopsy getting much more common looking at circulating tumor DNA. And what these do for us is these are identifying actionable genes that may not necessarily be inherited, but are present in the tumor and are very important for the therapeutic uh, <clears throat> approvals that we'll be talking about in a minute. Here's an example of one of the somatic tests. It looks for a whole bio, a whole, over 300 different actionable genes. It also tells you about something known as tumor mutational burden and microsatellite instability that may, um, that may uh, cause um, uh, or give you uh, opportunity to give other therapeutics to your patient. Again, here's just an illustrative example of the circulating factors. This is coming on strong, not commonly used yet. Somatic tumor biopsy of the tissue still represents the most common approach. And again, good correlation between matched tissue and liquid biopsies, uh, using these more in the future. Lastly, where's the emerging role of genetic testing in prostate cancer? Obviously from screening to active surveillance. In the last few minutes here, I wanna focus on why we're here, precision medicine for advanced therapeutics. Here's that long list of all the different agents that are available uh, to us, but I wanna point out those with genetic testing, rucaparib, olaparib, and pembrolizumab primarily are drugs in second, third, and fourth line treatment of castrate-resistant prostate cancer that rely on genetic or genomic testing. Both the PARP inhibitors were now improved over two years ago within a few days of each other. Um, both rucaparib and olaparib are now available for patients with advanced prostate cancer based on genetic testing. So let's circle back. DNA repair genes make proteins that repair double-stranded DNA breaks. And what happens is when you have a mutation, it can cause neoplastic growth. But what can happen is PARP enzymes step in and in place your mutated DNA repair genes and allow a cell that may be malignant to can continue to grow. But what we now have in a disposal are PARP inhibitors that interfere with that salvage polymerase uh, enzymes that are important for repairing single-stranded breaks. So when you have a mutated gene and you have a problem with neoplastic growth, the PARP can't continue that uh, by because you are blocking it now with the PARP inhibitors. Um, this is known as synthetic lethality, a complicated concept, very simply shown here. If you've got uh, mutated genes, the PARP, uh, PARP uh, steps in and allows the cell to survive. But if you block the PARP inhibitor with OLAP or rucaparib, you have a high likelihood of killing that malignant prostate cell. So rucaparib is used for patients with deleterious BRCA mutations. 
Olaparib, again, is used more with companion diagnostic biomarker testing, looking at a panel of uh, mutated genes um, using next generation sequencing. Uh, again, if you don't have uh, next generation sequencing and if tissue is unavailable for Olaparib, for example, you can do germline testing uh, through a bud sample that detects the abnormality. Somatic mutations identifying other actionable mutations include um, the mismatch repair genes uh, that everyone is familiar with. Microsatellite instability uh, is a marker um, that is also known as DNA mismatch repair. And again, pembrolizumab is approved for patients with microsatellite instability high or DNA mismatch repair deficient cancer. Again, third line and fourth line for advanced prostate cancer, but depends on having genomic or genetic testing. This is Lynch syndrome, uh, which can also be done by histology. We're familiar with this because of upper tract urothelial carcinoma that can be associated with colon cancer. But again, remember all of these inherited cancers at some point have <clears throat> frequently a common uh, inherited component. This has been mentioned before, but again, clinicians should offer PARP inhibitors to patients with these deleterious germline or somatic um, mutated genes that we've talked about. This is in the AUA, ASTRO, and SUO guideline from 2020. So to wrap up in the last couple of minutes here, why do we do germline and somatic testing? They're important for risk assessment in the individual and their family. Can we prevent this disease? We're not there yet, but clearly looking at things such as um, the, uh, the SNPs and polygenetic risk assessment, we may have some way to prevent prostate cancer. Certainly prognosis, is this aggressive or indolent disease? But most, most importantly today is treatment selection. Can the treatment be individualized based on results? And this is what genetic and genomic testing is most powerful for us, powerful for us when patients fail our standard therapies, it makes them eligible for uh, advanced disease. Um, I encourage you to review the uh, genetic germline um, uh, and genomic testing. Uh, today, every patient with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer or who presents with metastatic prostate cancer should undergo uh, genomic testing. And if you can get a tumor biopsy, should undergo tumatic, uh, somatic uh, sequencing. So again, this is a very rapidly evolving field. Our most critical genes today for both inherited and treatment are listed here. There's a high prevalence of germline mutations and metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. All these patients should undergo both genomic and if you have tissue biopsy, so somatic testing. And again, relying on genetic counselors uh, for inherited risk is very, very important today. And again, we are just at the tip of the ice Iceberg. There's a lot of our genome that's out there that we have no idea exactly what it does. And this will be consuming uh, our basic science researchers for many years to come. Uh, I thank you very much. And I thank the AUA, uh, Dr. Jared and Dr. Cookson for all the work they have done putting this course together. And thanks for letting me participate.